Welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm John Jenkinson. As we continue to deal with the coronavirus crisis, doctors are now looking to the future and the long-term effects of this virus. We know you have thoughts and questions about it. So tonight we're going to open our phone lines and give you a chance to talk to the experts, those on the forefront of the crisis. Call 877-731-6733. You're a big part of this show. So join the conversation tonight. Again, that number is 877-731-6733. Joining us live tonight from the University of Nebraska, Omaha, is the University of Nebraska Medical Center Chancellor, Dr. Jeff Rigold. Also joining us is Chief of Cardiovascular Medicine, Dr. Dan Anderson. Thank you both for being here tonight. Dr. Gold, let's start with an overview of how widespread COVID-19 is in rural America tonight. Well, John, uh, if we start to look at some of the graphics, it tells the tale of what's been happening uh, over the last several days across the country and specifically uh, in our rural communities. Uh, just over 5.7 million confirmed cases in the United States and approximately 177,000 uh, confirmed deaths. But when we look at rural America, we see the same story as we've seen week after week after week. And as the next graphic shows, uh, even our small farming and ranching communities widely strewn across the central part of the United States are continuing to see an uptick of cases. And whether it's due to back to school at the uh, K-12 level, and I'm sure we'll unpack that a little bit more later, or at the university level, or whether it's a wedding or a family gathering, or maybe it's uh, even planning uh, for the Memorial Day weekend, uh, those types of social gatherings have been directly linked to some of the outbreaks, both in small and large communities across the United States. When we look at the number of deaths, we're starting to see a favorable trend. It did dip in the early part of July, as we see here on this daily run chart of the seven-day running average. It then went up through the beginning of August. And with all of the explosion of cases that we saw in Arizona and in Florida, across North and South Carolina, uh, out in the West Coast, in California. Uh, we've now seen a slow but progressive fall in the number of deaths. And that was mirrored uh, early on by the number of actual cases per day. And as we see here, uh, we had this tremendous peak due to these large state outbreaks in middle and late July. And as we went into August, we started to see a week over week decline in the number of cases. And as of yesterday, for instance, uh, there were approximately 45,000 new confirmed cases per day and approximately 950 deaths. Now, we have to compare that to over 70, even 75,000 new cases per day uh, to uh, over 1,500 deaths per day in the United States. This bird's eye view of our nation shows you with the intensity of color where we're seeing the most rapid rates of expansion of the pandemic. And as you see, there is really no rural or urban community that does not have some color to it and a rapid rate of uh, increase. But compared to where we were last week, John, uh, we continue to make progress. And I am, as we say in the medical world, guardedly optimistic that we'll continue to see that progress over a period of time. This is a very important graphic in that it shows that going back uh, to one month ago, you know, July 25th, uh, almost a month ago, uh, that the United States has seen a slow but definite fall off in the number of new cases per million. But states such as Arizona, Louisiana, Florida, and others, due to their active intervention, use of facial coverings, social distancing, uh, work from home, those sorts of things have had a significant impact in the number of new cases per day per million. And hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll continue to see that as we go forward. Well, Dr. Anderson, we know COVID-19 is affecting the lungs and the breathing, but what are the heart experts starting to see now and what are the concerns? Well, I, I do think it's quite interesting that as we've gone along in the time frame of of the, the disease that we're now learning what's happening, you know, six to nine to 12 weeks after. 
And so as you've seen in the literature that it's been a lot of discussion recently, it was put out in the, the Journal of American Cardiology, the, the incidence of individuals who have been evaluated six to 12 weeks after the infection are seeing some changes. So I think there is an uncertainty about what's happening after we get over the acute infection of COVID-19. And with that, they're recognizing that in some individuals, there's some significant heart damage that's occurring within the first few weeks. Um, what we see with that is that with that heart damage, there's also the typical markers that we see when somebody has a heart attack. We think of that as a troponin measure. That's a protein that's released from heart tissue that's actually dying or has died. And it's a very reliable and sensitive measure for damage and injury to the, to the heart muscle. And that we, what we see is it's, it's increasing more or it's been more prevalent than the influenza virus. We don't know exactly what that means, but when we look at autopsy data, what we are seeing is that the types of injury and the amount of troponin that's increasing appears to be more, but we're not quite certain about what that actually means because it's really been a short window of time. What we've also noticed on some of these tissue specimens that have been evaluated is that there's damage to the heart tissue, there's clots that happen in the arteries, there's clots that happen in the veins, P people are having pulmonary embolisms. And while this isn't per se the heart tissue itself, it's part of the cardiovascular system that we all think of and the circulation of blood through the body. Um, with that, that heart damage, there's the worry about what's this mean, the death, the deaths that are reported with that. And so a lot of this information is really coming forth as we've been continuing to study individuals who have had COVID-19 and had the infection of the virus. And specifically, as I already mentioned, we looking at individuals 60 and 90 days after the diagnosis of the infection. What's been really quite striking in these papers that have been published is that 78% of these individuals with an average age of 45 to 53 had some heart involvement by that measure that we ta talked about, troponin, test, but also when you look with cardiac imaging, cardiac magnetic resonance imaging, which is a sensitive way to look at tissue damage, we see that there is tissue swelling and there's edema, just as if you would injure your thumb or cut your skin, you know that you get swelling of the skin, and that happens after some injury occurs. When they did biopsies on some of these people, there's evidence that 60% of these may have heart inflammation. And I think that's where the uncertainty really lies is, What's the extent and the scope of this? This is a group of people that are 45 to 53, and so it's a small window of those at risk for disease. I think what's been most concerning to people is that these findings are not related to pre-existing conditions. And what I mean by that and what we've talked about is that that's the individuals that you've heard about, the elderly, wasn't related to if you had diabetes or hypertension or pre-existing cardiovascular disease that put you at risk for the infection to begin with. And so I think that wasn't related to you know, the severity of the infection either. So when individuals had the, in, this testing done, it was a group of individuals who were not bothered by it, completely asymptomatic to the viral infection. It was also moderate symptomatic or more severe, and even in the most severe cases are hospitalized with the virus infection. So Dan, let's just unpack that a little bit okay. for a second. So as I understand the data, uh, these are individuals that were studied in this one study mm -hmm. that did not have a history of heart disease previously or some other major vascular or even minor vascular problem, that this was 60 to 90 days after they have had a complete recovery from the respiratory, meaning the fever, the congestion, the shortness of breath that is normally accompanying COVID, and that many of them, if not most of them, were not even aware that they had these changes going on in their heart. Would, would that be a, a reasonable explanation of, uh, of, of what we're seeing? Yes, and I think that was the real concern, was that these were people who were not symptomatic, and these were people that you know had, you know, uh, these findings up here. But with that, you know, that's the red flag in all of this. Um, I think I go back to emphasize to your point is that we don't know what the long-term consequence of that is. With there being asymptomatic and there was some injury and damage and scarring, we only have 90 days of understanding. And to some extent, what we really have learned in our history of studying other diseases is the notion that a lot of this scarring and fibrosis comes months after the initial insult or the initial infection or the damage. 
And so that's where we really are looking at a window of time where we need confirmation, we need additional research, and we need more data to really understand how this impacts our community. Well, you know, as, as a recovering uh, cardiac surgeon, uh, <laughs> If you ever recover from that disease, I don't know. It, 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 it's nearly fatal. Let like, me know I, how that works yeah, out. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's tough. It's a tough recovery. But, uh, you know, the cardiovascular world has treated inflammation of mm -hmm. the heart muscle for a long time. Viral myocarditis is not something new. No. And so it's not totally unexpected that COVID would have cardiac, would have central nervous system events uh, associated with it, kidney, liver disease, peripheral vascular disease, et cetera. Is there anything about this that's different than treating uh, inflammation of the heart muscle as we would treat it for an, any other type of viral disease? So I think uh, there's a limit in a lot of analogies to how we would treat with uh, you know, regular typical approaches just like we would treat you know, other myocarditis patients. We don't really understand exactly what that is. This slide here is a, is a picture of a pathology slide where we look under a microscope and look at the myocardial tissue and what you can see is a low power zoom low power image on the left and a high power image on the right and you see all the blue dots those blue dots are lymphocytes that have infiltrated or migrated into the heart muscle so they don't belong there is what you're saying uh, no nope, absolutely not in a normal heart there would be almost no blue dots compared to this mm. and if you look at the few cells that are on the top of the left side image and it's mostly pink that's kind of what a normal piece of the heart would look like so these blue dots in this collected area here are very abnormal and represent myocarditis and this is like a cardiac biopsy from yes. one of these individuals yep. so a biopsy from this in or unfortunately could be an autopsy specimen too sure. on the right hand side you just as a zoomed in image of looking at those white cells that are there and it just shows you there's way more white cells than there is muscle cells. Um, and if you, if, if you get into the details of it, it's just a, it's a very inflamed portion of the tissue. So virus causes inflammation. Inflammation causes these white cells or these little blue dots to accumulate. And all of that results in damage to heart muscle. That's yes. sort of the sequence of events yep. we're talking That's about. That's kind of here. what happens as far as the body gets insulted and then moves forward and repairs itself. Dan, we're hearing a lot of the term of myocarditis. Uh, would you go into detail and explain a little bit about what that means? So myocarditis is a, a medical term that we describe inflammation of the myocardial tissue. And so with that inflammation, what we look at is that the tissue under the microscope, just as that slide was showing, and we look for cells that are infiltrating, as Dr. Gold just kind of reiterated, that are there cleaning up a virus infection or trying to get rid of the virus that maybe has infected the cells. So myocarditis just reflects the pres presence of those cells within the myocardial tissue that would normally not be there. And what's the consequence of that? I mean, let's take it out of the COVID context for mm -hmm. a minute and let's just talk about myocarditis in general. Do most people recover completely or do they have a partial recovery? Is it dependent upon how much heart muscle is infected? Uh, what's, what's your usual take on that? So it does depend a bit of on how much of the heart muscle has been affected. You know, what we know is that just with a heart attack, when you have damage to the myocardium, and this would be a normal myocyte, the way and it kind of intertwines with each heart other. Heart muscle. Heart muscle, thank you. Right. Um, that with that, when- Don't forget, I'm a dumb surgeon. <laughs> With that, when there's damage um, before, because of a lot of reasons, we do not replace these cells. So as you damage your heart, you can end down, you go down this course of myocarditis, one example of damage, viral myocarditis, a more specific that example of that, can cause significant cardiac failure and heart failure. Um, and so heart failure is what we worry about at the end of myocarditis because this picture shows very similar myocytes or heart muscle cells that have been infiltrated with T cells and lymphocytes that come into the muscle tissue. And with that, they're cleaning up dead and or dying cells. And sometimes this inflammation 
these cellular response, these cells there, can actually cause damage while it's trying to clean up the damaged heart that's been... And ends up in some kind of scar tissue, right? And in scar tissue. And scar tissue is the really big concern we have. You know, with scar tissue, scar tissue is really the replacement of what used to be normal cells with collagen and elastin. And that's the kind of thing that we really worry about long term. So this is a bit of a complicated image that you're looking at. And it's a cardiac MR looking at scar tissue. Some people call it late gadolinium enhancement, and that's the more technical approach to it. And what you can see is in the left-hand image, there's four arrowheads there. And what they're pointing to is those white spots. Those white spots shouldn't be white. They should be black, like the rest of that muscle wall looks like. And if you look at the right image, you see the circle. That's a view of the heart kind of across the ventricle, so it looks like a little bit like a donut. Again, you see the arrows pointing to the white areas that shows where scar tissue has replaced normal muscle, which should look black. So the concern is, is that with this virus infection, you have damage of those cells. You have inflammation that comes in because of the viral injury. The, the inflammation comes in and cleans up the cells that have died, but the end result is scar tissue. And scar tissue doesn't squeeze. It's right. not a muscle. Exactly, and so that is the concern here, yep. is replacing normal beating heart muscle with this scar tissue, which then will Im impair the overall function of the heart muscle. Exactly right. And so I, I think the, the, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, please. So I think that you're with, I always try to tell my patients, when you have a heart attack, what you worry about is damage, as Dr. Gold alluded to. So a normal heartbeat, when it squeezes, squeezes about 65 to 75% of the blood out of the chamber. The typical normal person, when they squeeze, squeeze 100 milliliters, or I should say it fills with 100, squeezes 65 to 75. When you have heart failure, what you start to see is that that squeeze drops. So now you're squeezing 30%, 35%, and that's the signs and symptoms where people start having heart failure. I mean, I should say that's the definition of heart failure in a clinical manifestation, where you have symptoms of shortness of breath and fatigue. That, that carries a prognosis that is really quite concerning. So the relative concern here is now we have a virus that acts a lot like other viruses, this virus maybe is even more prone to causing heart failure and heart damage because of the injury and the scarring that occurs. And we don't know this yet because we only have 12 weeks of experience. And so I think that's the concern people are raising is where does this take us six months, 12 months, three years from now in an Meaning individual? how long lasting is this effect going to be and what's the long term impact of that going to be on the way people feel. Absolutely. I think that's the concern is what does it do for all of us. We just don't know. Dr. Anderson, you also have some images of an echocardiogram. Can you talk to those just a little bit? Sure. So this echocardiogram that we're going to show, some, when we use it clinically, is a movie. And with this, what you can see on the left-hand side and as an example, if we played this movie, you'd, you'd see this heart squeezing. So if you look at this image, there's a real bright spot in the middle. Just outside of that bright spot is a kind of a halo where it's, it's kind of speckled yellow, kind of white looking. That's where the muscle is. And so this left image was a patient that we've treated in the hospital recently where that ejection fraction, again, every time it would squeeze, it would squeeze and that chamber would scrunch down to the point where it'd squeeze out 65% of the blood, the big white spot, and that would get smaller, and we can measure that very accurately. So that tells us that the heart was squeezing and functioning normal. Three days after this echo, the image on the right was only squeezing at 25 to 30%. So in and this that, was a COVID-19 patient. Which was a COVID-19 patient. So the concern is, is there is a very easily recognizable dysfunction or failure of the heart to pump normally on that right image where it would only squeeze out that small amount of that And that portion. might cause some exercise limitation or even some shortness of breath or Absolutely. those sorts of things. I think when your ejection fraction drops to 
from 55 to 45 or 50 percent, I've had people who run marathons come to me and say, I just can't finish a race like I used to. You know, so losing five and 10 percent, I always use the analogy, it's like taking a, a, a spark plug wire off a of V8. You're back on seven cylinders. You know, so you lose sounds that like horsepower. Sounds like not seven. It sounds like, you know, you're taking a few of those spark plug wires yeah. off. Yeah, when you get to 25, you might as well take all four off, you know. And then it's a matter of, you know, how do you, how do you recover from that? What do you do? And some of that is not reversible. It doesn't come back. And that's the concern is once you've damaged a heart and you have an ejection fraction that's permanently at 25% despite best medicines, that's a poor prognosis. And that's Particularly a Particularly in a young person who is yep. an active person. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, so, uh, I, remember our phone lines are open. We'd love to hear from you tonight. The telephone number is 877-731-6733. We're going to take a break. More Rural Health Matters with the University of Nebraska Medical Center right after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. Joining us once again is University of Nebraska Medical Center Chancellor, Dr. Jeffrey Gold, and Chief of Cardiovascular Medicine, Dr. Dan Anderson. Dan, we were uh, talking about the potential long-term damage COVID-19 can cause. So could those who have recovered from it now have a heart condition and, and not necessarily know it? I think that is possible. I think the, the notion behind that is, is that while they were completely asymptomatic to the initial infection, there's been some damage that has occurred during that infection that now has become scar tissue. And does that affect the you know, long-term function of the myocardial tissue you know, such that it just doesn't perform well? And so that's where you could end up in a mild form of heart failure or even a more severe form of heart failure. And I think that's the uncertainty. So I do think you could be completely asymptomatic to it, come to your doctor because you're short of breath and fatigue. And we've seen these people in clinic um, where they had a mild infection, they weren't even in the hospital, they knew they had it because they felt some mild symptoms were tested positive, and then six to eight weeks later were short of breath and signs of heart failure. I mean, that's happening. Um, and we don't know how often that's going to happen. And I think you're right. That's the concern is there's damage and you don't recover from that. And, you know, John, it's going to get down to the question, particularly for, let's say, professional athletes, college athletes, mm -hmm. high school athletes, for that matter, before they're, quote, cleared, unquote, to practice, to compete, uh, how much cardiovascular imaging, how much confidence you're going to want to have uh, that they have normal cardiac function, that they're not going to mm -hmm. be at either risk for heart failure or at risk for irregularities of the heartbeat, uh, which sometimes does complicate yep. these types of inflammatory uh, diseases. Because, you know, 5 million, uh, you know, confirmed cases in the United States, I think in the last two weeks of July, there were 100,000 mm -hmm. American uh, young men and young women under the age of 18 with confirmed infections. I mean, you think about it. That would mean mm -hmm. scanning 100,000 uh, college athletes or, uh, or high school athletes. I mean, the, the thoughts of that are daunting. Yeah. yeah. I want to go to the, va yes. the uh, vascular aspect. How could COVID-19 affect blood vessels and parts of the uh, body other than the heart? So I think what we've seen in some of these studies that we've looked at, and they've been, we've known this process is occurring, to your point about how does it affect blood vessels in the heart, but also just blood vessels throughout the body. Um, early on in, in the uh, number of weeks ago, we saw that you know, people were having blood clots and pulmonary embolisms, which is a blood clot goes to the lung and makes it difficult to breathe. Um, we've also seen people with blood clots in the veins of the leg. But what we've noticed more recently is, is as people have come out of the infection, what we call in the convalescent phase, so they're over the acute infection, is that there's times where, you know, we see that there's blood clots that are in the arteries of the heart. Um, and we believe that there's blood clots in other tissues and other organs. Um, and why this infection has kind of a diverse presentation, whether it's the COVID toes people talk about or it's the heart failure or there's other problems that people have with other organs. So there is some the evidence that's growing now as we have time to look at all this that there are clots that are forming within arteries 
and veins. And, it, and we don't know exactly why that is, but we're starting to see that. And we see some evidence that it's associated with the virus itself. So, Dr. Gold, anything to add to that then? Well, there's a little question that when you talk to some of the COVID survivors, uh, that they feel mentally different. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and granted, uh, some of it is just anecdotal interview data, but having spoken with a number of people uh, who are in that condition and having watched a lot of these interviews on uh, you know, the evening news and, and whatever, uh, I've seen a number of young women and young men who were in very intellectually stimulating positions. Uh, you know, I remember one young woman uh, who was an artificial intelligence computer programmer. Mm -hmm. And she was in a situation now uh, three months, four months out from her infection where she couldn't even remember what she had for breakfast. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are, are not rare stories. Of, of, and, these, and she was never hospitalized, uh, was never given any of the medications uh, you know, that are currently being used for COVID. And so uh, I think to your point, Dan, is that we are just continually learning about not just the short-term mm -hmm. acute phases of this disease, but what I would refer to as the intermediate term, mm -hmm. because it's going to take probably five years to figure out what the long-term consequences are going to be in terms of recurrence, how much of the heart muscle heals, mm -hmm. what the impact of it is, uh, and, and basically ways that we can prevent that. And, you know, hopefully... Uh, we'll have safe and effective vaccines in the near future. We'll continue to learn about new types of therapies uh, that can be effective. We recently read an awful lot about convalescent serum. Uh, and those are all things that are going to allow us to better understand this disease and to prevent these long-term consequences that we're talking about tonight. Well, be sure and uh, give us a call if you have any questions, and you can ask the experts tonight. Telephone number is toll-free. It's 877-731-6733. We would love to hear from you tonight. Uh, Dr. Anderson, if, if we have people in the audience who have had COVID-19 and they're recovering or maybe know someone who has had it, what would you tell them to do in the next few months then? Should they be exercising? Should they take it easy? Uh, should they really pay close attention to how they feel? What's your advice? So I think all of those things are very appropriate when you think about, you know, being cautious with that. You know, it's, it's the same advice that your mom told you when you were younger. You know, if you've had an infection and you are now not feeling well, you know, you really should kind of step it back and not do, you know, your typical stressful exercise, things like that. Be cautious and wary because with all virus infections, you know, those can cause problems and what you don't want to do is overstress the body when the body's already stressed from the virus infection. I always tell my patients, you know, I said, I can run and I, I love running. It's, it's my exercise, it's my passion. You know, I do this with my wife, it's, it's, a, it's a great thing. But when I have a virus infection, it wipes me out and I'm on the couch. So to say I'm gonna go do something when you have a virus infection is just kind of against common sense approach to things. So I do think being cautious about it if you're after you've had the infection, even if maybe you're mildly symptomatic, I think it's worth a little bit of caution to make sure we're understanding this. Because as Dr. Gold mentioned a little bit ago, you know, there are p people in times where, you know, we have rhythm problems with infections. And what you don't want to do is stress the body at a point in a time when you have the potential for something to happen. And, you know, if you have a rhythm problem, some of these rhythm problems are very life-threatening. And when you have that rhythm problem, only two to 4% of people survive. So I do think a little bit of a common approach and common sense, not to overdo it, not to overstress, you know, be careful, talk to your physician, talk to your providers. You know, there's experts out here like us that would love to help answer your questions so you understand. Um, and, you know, be careful about, do I feel normal? Do I feel like I'm fatigued and I'm tired? Or, you know, am I just not back to baseline yet? You know, I think it's worth asking those questions and saying, am I maybe somebody who needs to be even more cautious while we learn about this? And maybe, you know, for the benefit of the audience tonight, Dan, we would say that certainly if an individual recovered from COVID and has a history of known heart disease, probably worth a conversation with your heart doctor. If you're at home and you're feeling particularly fatigued, short of breath, 
and you're you know several weeks out, you don't have that energy, time mm -hmm. to call. And certainly, if you're feeling any irregularities, your heartbeat, uh, never take that for granted. Absolutely. Lula from Georgia is on the line with us, gentlemen. Let's go to that phone call. And Lula, welcome to Rural Health Matters. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. What's your question? My question is, I have pulmonary fibrosis. And I've always had a heart problem. Now, how much more dangerous is that COVID virus to me. Dr. Anderson? Well, Lula, well, we can both take a yeah, shot at absolutely. that. And, uh, well, I'll turn it over to you in just a second. But we know that there are certain diseases uh, that cause increased risk, mm -hmm. uh, risk of hospitalization and risk of ending up in an intensive care unit or on a ventilator and tragically mm -hmm. even risk of dying. You think somebody that's got some heart disease and a diagnosis of pulmonary fibrosis probably falls into one of those risk categories? I do. And I think that what we're seeing is that, you know, when you have those underlying risks, as Dr. Gold indicated, you know, there is the, an increased risk. And, you know, when you have lung disease or heart disease, an infection of the lungs with the virus can impair the lungs to do what they need to do. And if they're already damaged or have because of other medical problems, you know, it does heighten the concern that it puts you at risk. So I agree. The University of Hong Kong has announced recently that it recorded its first case of coronavirus reinfection. What are your thoughts on the possibility of people getting reinfected then? Yeah, so uh, I'll share my thoughts on it because uh, there are a lot of what I would call anecdotal experiences with reinfection. And but w what we really mean by reinfection is somebody that has a confirmed case of COVID-19, they test positive, they recover clinically, meaning their fever, their shortness of breath, all of their symptoms go away, and then they test negative for it. They looking well, feeling swell, possibly back to work, back to school, back to a fairly normal life, and then they develop symptoms mm -hmm. again, and they are retested, and they test positive again. So that would be the classic scenario of a recurring infection. There are a couple of is issues with that. One is it's never really clear that they completely eliminated the virus. Mm -hmm. And they may have carried it with them for a period of time and had only a partial recovery. Of course, the concern is that this virus, as is the case of many viruses, continues to evolve. And it's an RNA virus. And every time that RNA duplicates in the virus, uh, there's a chance for a mutation. Mm -hmm. And that mutation can be significantly different enough that somebody can get reinfected. But the number of reinfections has been extremely small, even in the anecdotal side of the equation. We continue to track them. And I think as time goes on, we're going to learn more. And this is going to be particularly important when we start rolling out vaccines, because uh, if it is possible to get reinfected more than once, it's theoretically possible to get vaccinated and then mm. become ill even after successful vaccination mm. cycle. I don't know, Dan, do you have any thoughts about reinfection as it relates to uh, heart and vascular disease? Mm -hmm. and, and I do think that, you know, with that, I think it really brings up a great question that, you know, as we will learn what this means, especially like with the vaccines and that. Um, I do, there is more and more research that's coming out that, that suggests that the immune response to the virus can also be, you know, it's not like getting an MMR you know, vaccine where you get a robust immune response that is a, almost a cure for the diseases, those viruses. This one does not have that same kind of immune response. And I think there is a concern that the immunity wanes or diminishes over a period of months. It's related to the severity of the initial infection, but it wanes, you know, such that just like influenza, every year this comes around, it's different. And the immune response is not as robust as we'd like, so it keeps coming around. So. We, re, we are at risk of getting reinfected with influenza every year. And so I think it's going to be a very similar virus to that effect. And, of course, we shouldn't lose track of the fact, speaking of influenza, mm -hmm. that we're pretty close to heading into the flu season uh, across the United States, which is a good reason to remember to get your flu immunization. Yep. Patsy from North Carolina joins us tonight here on Rural Health Matters. Good evening, Patsy. What's your question? 
Hello. Um, my question is, I have underlying health conditions, and my fiancé wants to go on, take his friend who would need assistance on a boat ride. I know in his household, people travel, they go places for the weekend, he has health care workers coming in, and uh, he thinks it would be okay for him to go in his truck because he would have to have assistance and go on the boat if I don't go. But the point is, if he's around these people, he could get it and carry it to, back to me, which I would be the one that would not do so well. They feel if everybody doesn't feel sick, that, that they don't have COVID, and I don't believe that's true. Well, Patsy, uh, you know, it's a great question, and mm -hmm. thanks so much for being so thoughtful in the way you asked it. Uh, obviously, we now know enough about this virus to know that there are a lot of people who have few or no symptoms who are actively inf not only infected, but can carry the virus and infect other people, particularly if you are at higher risk, if you're vulnerable because of uh, either age or other diseases, as uh, Dr. Anderson and I were just talking about. You want to be particularly careful. So my best advice would be, uh, you know, uh, we've gone through so much for the last six months together. We need to get through to the point of having a available, safe, and effective vaccine. And if that means not going on that boat trip, if it means not spending time in the group of other people, you know, we talk about so many different anecdotes. There was recently, uh, oh, uh, you know, if if, if you just. Uh, there was a choir practice in, in one of our states, one of our southern states recently, in which there are over 90 people who were involved in that choir practice, and one of them turned out to have COVID. Mm -hmm. Didn't know it, but turned out to have COVID. Spent a few hours practicing, and uh, before you know it, almost all of those 90 people uh, who mm -hmm. were at that choir practice ended up infected. Some of them ended up in the hospital, a small number, uh, where he's in of course, in intensive care uh, mm -hmm. as well. So, Patsy, uh, our best advice, my best advice, let's put it this way. If you were a member of my family, I would say don't do it. Okay, well, Patsy, uh, thank you very much for the call. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, gentlemen, but uh, our phone lines are open if you'd like to join us. 877-731-6733. More Rural Health Matters with the University of Nebraska Medical Center in just a moment. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. Joining us once again is University of Nebraska Medical Center Chancellor, Dr. Jeffrey Gold, Chief of Cardiovascular Medicine, Dr. Dan Anderson. Dr. Gold, uh, earlier you were talking a lot about vaccines. And one of the things, one of the questions we always hear is, is it true that your medical center will be conducting clinical trials on a vaccine relatively soon? Uh, the answer, uh, John, is yes. Uh, we have uh, signed, uh, I believe, at least four contracts with some of the major warp speed uh, manufacturers. But as the uh, audience probably knows, we've talked a lot about this, there are over 160 different vaccines that are being developed worldwide. Uh, approximately 135, as this graphic shows, are still in the lab. They're not in human trials. They're either in animal trials or they're still in test tube development. And then there are about 34, 35 that are in either phase one or phase two trials, which are safety trials. And there are eight that are in clinical trials in different parts of the world, including uh, in the United States. And some of the data on these eight that are in uh, efficacy trials uh, does seem to be very positive. I've seen some recent data that looks at the ability to uh, develop large uh, and specific titers uh, amounts of uh, antibody uh, to COVID-19. So I am very optimistic that we will have both safe and effective vaccines, and frankly, in a relatively short period of time. You know, we'd originally thought January, February, March for some of these vaccines, but I'm going to base, you know, late fall, early winter. Uh, I think that we will be on some of the phase three trials, which are typically between 10 and 20,000 people each, uh, and into a... Uh, widespread vaccination program. I know that these manufacturers, uh, particularly the warp speed manufacturers, are manufacturing literally hundreds of millions of doses uh, as we speak. Well, as a follow-up question then, once there is a vaccine, how long does it take 
until enough of the population has received it before we can all feel safe and start to relax and go back to what we knew as a normal lifestyle before the coronavirus? Also uh, a very good question, and unfortunately the answer is a bit unknown because it's not clear whether a single dose of the vaccine will do the job or you'll need two or possibly even three. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes in a really bad flu season, particularly for some of our older and more vulnerable populations, we do recommend two uh, flu shots. But uh, my guess is uh, it's going to depend on the community as opposed to on the totality of the nation, herd immunity or the percentage of the population that's necessary uh, to be immune to stop the spread of the virus is probably somewhere north of 200 million people in the United States of America. Could be as many as 250 million. That's a lot of people. But, you know, you think about it. Uh, if we talk about some of our rural communities uh, and get down to a more uh, community-based mm -hmm. uh, level, if we're talking about a community of <clears throat> 2,000 people, you know, I'll bet you that if we could get 1,000 people immunized, 1,200, uh, you could make a major uh, impact, particularly if you're talking about your health care providers, you know, your essential uh, personnel, and interestingly, our school children, mm -hmm. because we know that although they may be relatively less symptomatic, they are the carriers to a very large extent, particularly in the K-12 system uh, of this virus. And if we can reduce the spread through making our schools uh, safe, you know, through uh, immunization, that would be a really, really good thing to do. So, you know, that's going to take weeks to months to, uh, to get that vaccine out there and, you know, get people to roll up their sleeve and uh, get vaccinated. Is there any way to speculate whether, you know, and you mentioned earlier, uh, we're getting ready to go into the fall and the winter months where it closes everybody in and we're going to be back in close proximity with one another. Is anybody speculating yet on if that could, in fact, ramp back up this coronavirus uh, spreading or uh, is this uh, is it going to be incumbent upon all of us to take even further safety measures wearing the mask washing hands more often keeping the six foot distance sure well it's going to be all of the above uh, i think bringing people back indoors and in closer proximity obviously is going to increase the risk uh, bringing students uh, and teachers and staff back to school is going to increase the risk of the spread of virus, whether it's in the K-12 schools, universities, uh, all, all, the whole spectrum of it. People that are coming back to work, you know, wanting to work from their offices, mm -hmm. travel more on airplanes, you know, airplanes, schools, churches, they're like cruise ships, you know. We've, uh, we've learned that experience once. We're going to see it more. Now, the good news is that we know far more about this virus uh, than we knew six months ago. Mm -hmm. We know how important hand washing is. We know how important wearing a face mask is and protecting each other and ourselves from the spread. We know about physical distancing. We know about how to use hand sanitizers. And all of those things are going to be absolutely critical. So it's going to be a very, very delicate balance, John, between the risk of closer proximity and the better knowledge of how to prevent the spread. Gentlemen, I want to take you back to North Carolina, and Tony has called in. Good evening, Tony. Welcome to the program. Your question. Yes. Hi, guys. I love your show. Um, I'm wondering um, on some time limits, uh, like maybe five or ten minutes. Um, I do a, some uh, tractor work. I'm on a tractor, and I have people to come up to me um, um, briefly. And uh, I'm wearing a mask, and they're not wearing a mask. And I'm wondering if, uh, w what are my odds of um, um, ca catching COVID? Uh, and I'm outside. Um, and if I go inside also, if it's five or 10 minutes, um, what's my odds of contracting the virus? So it's a great question, Tony. Uh, first of all, outside's better than inside. Wearing a mask uh, is better than not wearing a mask. And the data has shown that 10 or 15 minutes uh, in close contact, and you'll notice Dr. Anderson and I are more than six feet apart tonight, which is why neither of us is wearing a mask, although we both have our mask uh, right here, just in case you're uh, wondering. Uh, but it, the data has shown that 10 or 15 minutes is more than enough 
uh, to transmit live virus. And there have been any number of instances with school children, teachers, two people that, you know, come together for a cup of coffee and tough to drink coffee with a mask on, let me tell you. Not that I've tried, but uh, I don't recommend it. Uh, but all it takes is 10 or 15 minutes and, uh, and you can transmit this virus, particularly if somebody is sneezing, coughing, uh, speaking particularly loudly, singing, playing a musical instrument. Those are the kinds of things uh, that really raise the risk. So, Tony, uh, you know, I would say if you can maintain six-foot distance, stay on your tractor, uh, and stay outdoors when you're with other people who are not wearing a mask. But, you know, I'll tell you, I, I have no problem uh, stopping people uh, who I mm -hmm. run into in the grocery or in the pharmacy or on the campus and say, you know, put on your mask. You know, sometimes I see it hanging down below their chin, and that's a token gesture. Uh, it needs to cover their nose and their mouth, and it needs to be form-fitting. And we know that, they know that, in wearing it around their chin or wearing it on the wrist uh, doesn't make any points in my book. Dr. Gold, just to clarify, a vaccine and a cure are two different things. Will there ever be a cure for coronavirus, you think? You know, there are so many different things that are going on right now to treat uh, this viral disease, both in the early stages and in the later stages. And, you know, we've read a lot about remdesivir. We've talked about it on this show uh, extensively. We've talked about dexamethasone, a steroid treatment. Certainly the use of convalescent serum has been in the media recently. Convalescent serum has been used to treat Ebola and dengue fever and, and all kinds of other uh, diseases. And it's been used uh, widely across the United States and around the world uh, to treat COVID-19. Indeed, you know, by a recent calculation, there have been over 70,000 people treated with convalescent serum. And what that means, for those that may not be familiar with the term, is people that have recovered from COVID, as we know, make antibodies. <clears throat> That's how you recover from the disease. And so if you donate your blood uh, and, the white, and the clear part of your blood, which is called the plasma or the serum components, can be removed from the red cells and you get your red cells back, uh, you can concentrate that up and then give it to somebody who doesn't have antibodies and you can buy some time until they make their own mm -hmm. antibodies. And there definitely seems to be a survival advantage and also a diminution of the severity of illness. Is it a cure? Uh, it's not a cure. But does it get people out of the hospital faster? Uh, the FDA has recently approved it under emergency use authorization, and I think we're going to be seeing more and more. There's also a possibility of making these antibodies, manufacturing these antibodies in a laboratory. And there are a number of small and large pharmaceutical companies across the United States and around the world that are doing exactly that. So yes, uh, I am optimistic that there will be both a vaccine to prevent the spread of COVID-19, and there'll also be very effective treatments, whether there'll be true cures. You know, very few of these uh, viral diseases have mm -hmm. true cures, but can keep people out of hospitals, off ventilators. I'm pretty optimistic about that. And also in the same time frame, I'd say, you know, within six months, we will learn a lot more about this disease. Dave from Virginia has called in. Dave, thank you very much for the phone call. What's your question? Uh, I'm interested in finding out if hydrochloroquine is an effective deterrent to uh, COVID-19. And if you have a heart problem, uh, you have a, uh, a physical ailment that should you be prescribed with that? Sure, Dave. Uh, you know, the research data so far uh, on all of the chloroquine-related drugs have not shown a significant amount of efficacy in either preventing or treating either early stage or late stage. Now, there are ongoing large trials mm -hmm. in the United States, including uh, specifically around healthcare professionals who are in the trenches taking care of COVID-19 patients who you would think are at about the highest risk of, of getting uh, the disease. But you ask a really good question about people, uh, mm -hmm. chloroquine-related drugs and heart disease, and we know that one of the side effects of these drugs, uh, and Dan, you can specifically comment on this, is an irregularity mm -hmm. of the heartbeat. Is that not right? That is correct. And I think what we have learned or what we see 
And this is a medication that's been used for many, many years, is that it can cause changes in someone's electrical activity of the heart such that it could put you at risk for a life-threatening rhythm. And so that needs to be monitored closely, and I think that's the uncertainty about taking hydrochloroquine and at the same time then having a rhythm problem that has a high mortality to it. So the, the, it's just, you have to be insightful about when you're using these things as to the other impacts, or often we are, uh, refer to as the unintended consequence. So it's all in a balance. It's between how certainly mm -hmm. or how effective the drug is and what the side effects are. Exactly. Dr. Gold, how is uh, back to school going there in Nebraska? And tell us about the UNMC checklist that you've put together. Sure. Well, uh, today is actually the first official day of class for mm -hmm. our incoming uh, first-time students, which is always very exciting on a university mm -hmm. campus. Uh, I'm sure many of us remember mm -hmm. either ourselves or our, our youngins when, uh, when they headed off to school. Uh, uh, mixed set of emotions there. Uh, but we have seven rules uh, that we have followed, and uh, we have a graphic. Uh, one of them, of course, uh, before coming to campus is uh, work and study from home when you can. Uh, don't congregate in groups. Uh, we ask all of our students, faculty, and staff to self-screen using our smartphone app called One Check COVID. Stay away from campus if you screen positive and contact your healthcare professional. Wear a mask that covers your mouth and nose. Wear a mask, wear a mask, wear a mask. Mm -hmm. Remain at least six feet and away from others at all times. Wash your hands frequently. And help to disinfect your personal and classroom space. That is to say, if you're sitting at a desk like I am now, before I get up, we're going to scrub down the desk <laughs> with a disinfectant and make it safe uh, for the next person. So these seven rules, you know, we try to get it really simple. Uh, and, uh, and here you go. Uh, you can learn those seven. I think you got it. Any final thoughts for our audience tonight? Yeah, I would say, uh, as is frequently the case, uh, this is about personal responsibility. This mm -hmm. is about us not just taking care of ourselves and our families, but taking care of the communities that we care about so much. And these same simple things that we just talked about on campus, Everything from facial protection, personal social distancing, uh, hand sanitizing. Until we get those effective vaccines and those effective antivirals, uh, we need to rely on those simple measures. Dan, any final thoughts? Agree completely. One, thank you for having me on here tonight. And, and as to reiterate, hand washing, masks, and, you know, stay the distance. You know, prevent the infection. Well, gentlemen, thank you both for joining us tonight. UNMC Chancellor Dr. Jeffrey Gold and Chief of Cardiovascular Medicine, Dr. Dan Anderson. Gentlemen, you've done a great job, and I think that you bring up a lot of great points, how we all have to be very vigilant and uh, really pay attention and take very good care of ourselves so that we can uh, continue to fight this and, and get past this uh, and, and continue to move forward. By the way, you can catch Rural Health Matters every Monday at 6 p.m. Eastern, 5 Central, right here. You're such an important part of this program. If you have a question, uh, you can always call in live, or you can even leave us a message on our hotline. That number is 855-776-6147. Thanks again for joining us, and good night from Rural America's most important network. Mm -hmm.